Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you for this wonderful opportunity once again to open up your holy word. Father, we thank you that we have your self-revelation, your word that reveals who you are, your glorious plan of salvation to glorify yourself in the redemption of sinners and the building up of your church that reveals to us that one day Christ will be returning and we will reign with him forever and ever worshiping you. Father, help us to be reminded of that glorious truth this morning and that this corporate worship service is a glimpse of that, where we worship you together, we hear your word together. Lord, bless our time. Help us to respond to your word um, and to be doers of your word, who are not merely hearers, who are self-deceived, but that we would respond in worship and praise and with a sense of mission on this earth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verses 14 through 17 uh, will be the verses that we're going to focus upon this morning in our time in God's Word. And as you know, we're doing a series this summer on uh, ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. Uh, we titled it, Who We Are, specifically talking about our, um, our identity as a church from the Word of God as the Bible defines the church. And it's specifically tailored, as you know, toward our uh, Calvary distinctives, we call them, those principles that we want to govern and guide everything that we do as a church that are biblical priorities. I hope that you've picked up one of these bookmarks uh, that you can pick up at the Welcome Center. Um, on the one side, you have our mission statement as a church, which is really an articulation of the Great Commission. And then on the other side, you have our eight Calvary distinctives. Again, those things, that principles from God's Word that we want to govern and guide our church and the life of our church and everything that we do here at the church. So make sure that you pick up uh, one of these. We have been working through those Calvary distinctives. So this study on ecclesiology is both theological and very practical for us as we look at those distinctives and what we are to be about as a church. We've already seen uh, a few weeks ago the nature of the church. We define the church as the assembly of God's redeemed people who've um, repented of their sins and put their trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We are an assembly of God's redeemed people, those who have been bought out of slavery to sin and have, are now uh, uh, slaves of Jesus Christ. We serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've trusted in him. And then we saw that we are a Bible-centered church, that the Word of God, God's Bible, his, 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 his self-revelation, that the scriptures teach us about the way of salvation. It is through the word of God, the Bible, that we are saved because it contains the message of the gospel. We are sanctified, and the word of God then equips us also to be able to serve him on this earth. And then we saw that the church is to be a worship-motivated community of believers, that all of life is for the supreme purpose of worshiping God. We know that the reason why we proclaim the gospel is so that people would bow the knee to the king of the universe and that we would, they would join the heavenly choir, if you will, and worship God Almighty here on this earth and forevermore as those who have bowed the knee to King Jesus. We are a worship-motivated church. And then last week, if you remember, we saw that we are a God-dependent church, that by the grace of God and the strength that the Spirit of God supplies, we strive to be a God-dependent church. We recognize that in all of life, if we are to do anything of significance on this earth, then we ought to be doing it depending upon our Heavenly Father in all things. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing, right? That's what the Lord, the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 15. Abide in me, for apart from me you can do absolutely nothing. So, and this morning we have the privilege of looking at another distinctive, and it is that we are a mission-focused church, a mission-focused church. And what I want to do this morning, beloved, is I want to tailor this message specifically to the issue of evangelism, the issue of evangelism. You know, oftentimes, I'm speaking of the Reisdorfs, who are heading out to Poland uh, very soon. Oftentimes, we think of uh, mission, or we talk about missions, as something that happens out there, Outside of our community, outside of our country, uh, of our country, something that people like the Reisdorfs and others go out and do in some foreign mission field with unreached peoples and all of that. You know, we talk about supporting our missionaries, and by that we often mean that these are the people that go out to other places to do the work that uh, of the gospel while we stay back home 
take care of our families, maintain life, struggle here in America, and make a living, etc., 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 right? We talk many times about mission or missions that way, if it's something that other people do. But the Bible makes it very clear that mission is a way of life for Christians. Mission is a way of life for the collective corporate church. Mission is why you and I are here, to do the mission of the gospel. We are, if we could put it this way, as someone else has better put it, we are disciple-making disciples. We are those who, part and parcel of following the Lord Jesus Christ as disciples, is to be making other disciples, other fully committed, devoted followers of Jesus Christ. As someone has said, if you are not fishing, then maybe you are not following. If you are not fishing, then maybe you are not following. And so this message is something that I want to bring to your attention this morning, and we want to bring to your attention as your shepherds to get you to examine your heart in this area of evangelism and whether you're truly committed and devoted to doing the work of the gospel here in our community and outside of Burbank, wherever the Lord, um, wherever you live. Because you see, the, the danger, beloved, is that we can become so introverted as a church We can become so self-focused where we become very, very content with being a strong church in what we call the area of edification, of building up, of equipping the the current Christians that are here. And that's something that obviously is, is a priority, edification, the building up of current believers. That is part of disciple making. But all the while neglecting the fact that we are also called to do evangelism that we're called to be proclaiming the gospel so that other people can come in and we begin to build them up in the faith as well. You see, beloved, we can become, uh, we can be at fault for having a either active or passive sort of us for no more mentality. We are not diligently sharing our faith as individuals or even collectively as a corporate body in initiatives to share the gospel with our surrounding community here in Burbank or outside of Burbank. We can be in danger of not being zealous sharers of the Lord Jesus Christ, his person and his work and what he's, what he's done. Let me ask you just by way of introduction, when was the last time that you shared Christ with someone? When was the last time that you witnessed about Jesus Christ to someone in your particular context of influence, wherever the Lord has you? When was the last time that you shared your testimony and then, as your, uh, and then used your, your testimony as a springboard to share about Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross for sinners, that he paid for our sins? that he took God's wrath and punishment for our sins and that he rose again from the dead victorious over sin and death and that he's the only hope of salvation from sin and condemnation for anyone who believes. When was the last time that you shared the message of Jesus and called someone to repentance to turn from their wicked lifestyle of self-idolatry and put their faith in Jesus Christ so that they would have hope in this world? I want you to think about that. See, we become so apathetic, so complacent many times in this area of evangelism, and that's why I want us to focus our attention upon this issue. There is a very helpful um, account, or um, uh, yeah, just account of William Booth's vision of the lost in a book that I read a while back called The Vine Project. I would encourage you to pick it up. It really focuses on the issue of disciple-making in the church, having a culture of disciple-making. And listen to what William Booth, who was the founder of the Salvation Army, what he wrote about the urgency of evangelism and our neglect of it. He writes this, I saw a dark and stormy ocean. Over it, the black clouds hung heavily. Through them every now and then, vivid winds moaned, and the waves rose and foamed, towered and broke, only to rise and foam, tower and break again. In that ocean, I thought I saw myriads of poor human beings plunging and floating, shouting and shrieking, cursing and struggling and drowning. And as they cursed and screamed, they rose and shrieked again, and then some sank to rise no more. And I saw out of this dark, angry ocean a mighty rock 
that rose up with its summit towering high above the black clouds that overhung the stormy sea. And all around the base of this great rock I saw a vast platform. Onto this platform I saw with delight a number of the poor struggling drowning wretches continually climbing out of the angry ocean. And I saw that a few of those who were already safe on the platform were helping the poor creatures still in the angry waters to reach the place of safety. On looking more closely, I found a number of those who had been rescued industriously working and scheming by ladders and ropes and boats and other means more effective to deliver the poor strugglers out of the sea. Here and there were some who actually jumped into the water, regardless of the consequences and their passion to quote-unquote rescue the perishing. And I hardly know which gladdened me the most. The sight of the poor drowning people climbing onto the rocks, reaching a place of safety, or the devotion and self-sacrifice of those whose whole being was wrapped up in the effort for their deliverance. And as I looked on, I saw that the occupants of that platform were quite a mixed company. That is, they were divided into different sets or classes of people, and they occupied themselves with different pleasures and employments but only a very few of them seemed to make it their business to get the people out of the sea. But what puzzled me most was the fact that though all of them had been rescued at one time or another from the ocean, nearly everyone seemed to have forgotten all about it. Anyway, it seemed the memory of its darkness and danger no longer troubled them at all. And what seemed equally strange and perplexing to me was that these people did not even seem to have any care that is, any agonizing care about the poor perishing ones who were struggling and drowning right before their very eyes, many of whom were their own husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, and even their own children, End quote. What a sobering vision, huh? What a sobering vision, and even though it is fictional, it's so illustrative, beloved, of how many of us live our lives that we have forgotten what it's like or what it was like to be lost, to be dead in our trespasses and sins, to be hopeless and without God in this world, to have no joy in the fact that even though things on this earth are not what we would desire for them to be, that we live in a broken world, that we have a future hope when Jesus returns. Some of us have forgotten what it was like not to have any hope. Some of us have lost, beloved, a sense of our mission to evangelize the lost here on this earth, beginning with our our context where God may have us. Well, the Apostle Paul lived with a sense of mission, didn't he? And what we heard from our brother uh, Tim Carnes earlier that he read from Romans chapter 1 is that Paul was focused on his mission. He was a mission-focused Christian, And even with regards to the church in Rome, in the capital city of the Roman Empire, a pagan city full of rampant wickedness, even though he had never been to Rome, he writes to this Christian church in Rome telling them that he longed to visit them because he wanted to to be fruitful among them, edify them, and he longed to share the gospel with the pagan wicked people in the Roman capital of Rome. He was a mission-focused Christian. And so what I want us to focus upon this morning is looking at the heart of this man. Because I think specifically here in verses 14 through 17, we get a glimpse of the heart of this mission-focused Christian, the Apostle Paul. And what I want us to do, beloved, as far as taking notes, if you're taking notes, I want you to hang your thoughts on three primary statements that we find the Apostle Paul making in verses 14 through 17. Let me read the text for us, and I'll highlight these statements. The first one is in verse 14, where he says, if you notice, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. I am under obligation Secondly, verse 15, so for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. I am eager to preach the gospel, he says, secondly. And then thirdly, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Third statement, why? For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. 
I want essentially to build our outline around those three statements and, and call them three commitments of the mission-focused Christian. Three commitments of the mission-focused Christian. And as we look at these, these really become <clears throat> a sort of litmus test for you and I as Christians to gauge whether you are truly living as a mission-focused Christian wherever the Lord may have you influence the world for him, okay? The first thing that I want us to note is the first commitment that we see from the Apostle Paul and must be true of us is that the gospel must be our purpose. The gospel must be our purpose, beloved. And I put it that way because for many of us, even though we give lip service to the fact that the gospel is everything, I live for the gospel, the reality of it is, is that when we look at your life and we survey it, the way that you use your time and certain priorities that you may have, it's very evident that the gospel is not your purpose. And so we see the heart of this apostle here. He shares his heart with them and he says, notice in verse 14, I am under obligation, he says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Paul says whether it's the, the educated, the Greeks, those who are highly educated, well-to-do, well-versed in the Greek culture or language of the day, whether it's the educated or the unsophisticated barbarians, he calls them there, the unsophisticated, those not cultured in language or education, he says, I am under obligation to minister the gospel to all kinds of people. Later on, he says, to Jews and Gentiles alike. He says, I'm under obligation to preach the gospel to all. I love how the New King James Version translates this in verse 14. It puts it, I am a debtor. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians. In what sense was Paul a debtor to all people like he puts it here? That he owed them something, namely the, the gospel. Well, you and I can be a debtor. I can be a debtor in one of two ways. I can be a debtor to you, owe you something, if I had borrowed money from you and not paid it back, right? But I can also be a debtor to you if someone were to give me one of your possessions, something that belonged to you, some money for you, and I never give it, give it to you. I never give you what belongs to you. I keep it to myself. And it was in this latter sense, beloved, that Paul says, I am under obligation. I am a debtor to all kinds of people because God had deposited the message of the gospel to Paul so that he would pass it on, not hoard it, not keep it to himself, but to pass it on to other people, to all kinds of people, to impart the gospel to everyone who would listen Paul talks a lot about this calling that he had, this deposit that God had given him, this precious message of the gospel that he was a steward of. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 7, Paul says that he had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11, he says that God had entrusted him with the glorious gospel of the blessed God. And then in Titus chapter 1 verse 3, Paul speaks of the fact that he was entrusted with the proclamation of God's word. And so this is why Paul says in verse 14, listen, I am under obligation. I am a debtor. God has given me a, pre a precious message to pass on, namely the gospel. And I'm not going to keep it to myself. I'm not going to keep it to myself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, he says this, let a man... Regard us in this manner as servants of Christ, and then he says, and stewards of the mysteries of God. I love that word, steward. It refers to a, a household manager, someone who, A, was a caretaker of someone else's possessions, namely his master, but also, listen, secondly, was charged to advance the cause and purposes of his master, to gain profit for his master to advance and progress his assets on this earth. That's the term, term that Paul uses. We are stewards of the mysteries of God. We are those called who, who have been charged and given this precious possession called the message of the gospel, the good news concerning the person and the work of Christ. And I am not going to keep it to myself. I am a steward of that. And my call is to be faithful. He goes on to say there in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2, in this case, moreover, as stewards of the mysteries of God, it is required that stewards be found 
trustworthy or faithful. He says, I want to be faithful. I want to be faithful. God has given me this wonderful deposit. I am a debtor to all people. And beloved, listen to me. Even though Paul had a unique office of apostleship, we too as followers of Jesus are those who have been given the great commission, right? Our supreme purpose and goal, listen to me, is to be sharing the message of good news with people who are lost in this world. That is why we are here, beloved, to impart the truth to all people, rich or poor, educated or uneducated, intellectual or not, making no distinction of class, social standing, color of skin, or ethnic background. Amen? All people should hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, God is not partial about who should hear the gospel. He's charged us to share and preach the gospel to all. Like that person you can't stand because they are so different than you. They are wired so differently than you. Their personality and maybe background is very different. Maybe their skin color is different than yours. Listen, you have a responsibility, even with people who are different than you, who don't know Christ, to share the message of the good news of the person and work of Jesus to them. To share Christ, that highly intellectual person that makes you feel like you're, a, you're some kind of a cockroach every time you talk to them. You met those people who talk about the gospel? It's foolishness, just like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1. To those who are perishing, the gospel is foolishness. But to us who are the saved, it is the power of God, right? Even that person who thinks of Christianity and the gospel as anti-intellectual, anti-philosophical, outdated, traditional Christianity, social constructs that no longer should be imposed on other people, all of that terminology, beloved, we oftentimes can feel like we're nothing, right? But you know what? We have a responsibility to share the gospel with those intellectuals because the gospel is the power of God. Amen? The gospel can transform a person like that so that they move from their foolishness and their intellect to now bowing the knee to King Jesus. That liberal, that you can't stand because they don't hold the views that you hold from God's precious word. That liberal thinker needs Jesus Christ, beloved. They need Christ. What about that conservative? That, oh, you appreciate them so much because they stand for all the same things that Christians stand for while all the while rejecting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We have a lot of those people today, don't we? A lot of conservative thinkers who are anti some of the same things that Christians are against, but they reject your Lord and Savior. They need Christ too. They need Christ. Otherwise, there's no hope for them beyond this world, no matter how conservative or moralist they might be. All of these people need Christ. We have the proclamation of the gospel, as Paul did, beloved, as our purpose as well. We are here to evangelize the lost. 2 Corinthians 5.18, Paul says we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. That's language of relationship. We are those who are begging people, be reconciled to your creator. You are living in rebellion against him. He created you for his glory, to enjoy him forever. You have lived a life of self-idolatry and self-worship. Be reconciled to God, your maker. Otherwise, there are consequences coming. You will be eternally separated from him. We are those, beloved, who are seeking to call people sinners and rebellion against God to be reconciled to their maker, right? We have the ministry of reconciliation. That's for everybody, not just for the apostles. For every single Christian, it's the great commission. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, it says we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. What does an ambassador do? An ambassador represents his country, right? An ambassador advances the, the, the cause or the interests of his country, of his government, Listen, that's what we are, beloved, on this earth. This world is not our home. We are citizens of a heavenly kingdom, of a future kingdom. But while we are here on this earth, we are ambassadors for Christ, representing God and his gospel and his purposes to the world and seeking to advance his interests through the gospel in the context of the local church here on earth, right? That's what we are, beloved. Let's not, let us not lose sight of our purpose 
So many of us are so preoccupied, so complacent, so apathetic, so fearful of the culture around us. Listen, God gives grace for us to, to, to follow through with what he has charged us to do. Amen? He will grant us the grace. We are called to be lovingly obedient to him, to our purpose of sharing Christ with people. Now, I want you to notice, secondly, that while the gospel was Paul's purpose, this purpose, listen, was fueled by his inward passion. We see this in verse 15, that the gospel must be our passion. And I realize that that word passion oftentimes has a negative connotation. You can be passionate about the wrong kinds of things, right? About sinful things. But I'm talking about being passionate about the right kinds of things. And at the top of the list, namely the gospel of Jesus Christ, notice what he says in verse 15. So for my part, he says, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. I want you to think about this. Paul had never met these Christians in Rome. And yet he was eager, as he says here, passionate, zealous about imparting the gospel to them. I mean, isn't it easier to be a mission-focused person who is very passionate about proclaiming the gospel to those whom we know? It's one thing to be passionate about proclaiming the gospel to people whom we know. It's quite another thing to have the heart of Paul, who's never seen or met many of those non-believers at the epicenter of paganism in Rome and have a heart to share the gospel with them, right? He's passionate about proclaiming the gospel to them, about building up people. Notice how he expresses his longing to impart the gospel back in verse 11 of chapter 1. He says, for I long to see you to these believers first, so that I may impart some spiritual fruit to you. Paul wants to be fruitful amongst the believers. He wants to edify them, that you may be established or strengthened is the idea there. And then look at verse 13. He says, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented thus far so that I may obtain some fruit among you also. I want to edify you. But then listen to this. Even as among the rest of the Gentiles, and Gentiles there has the idea of non-believers, non-Christians. He's talking about evangelistic fruitfulness. Paul longs to see these people both to edify the believers and he's zealous, ambitious to see other people who don't know Christ worship Jesus Christ. Paul was not only willing, but eager to preach the gospel to these people. The gospel was not only his purpose, but his, his passion, the passion of his, of his heart. Now I ask you, what motivated this man? What is it that motivated the Apostle Paul to be a man eager to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ? And I think he tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. He says this, for the love of Christ controls us. Did you hear that? For the love of Christ controls us. And he doesn't mean there our love for Christ, but the love that comes to us from Christ. Christ's love for Paul compelled, motivated, fueled the Apostle Paul then to be one who loved other people enough to share the message of Christ with them. God's love for us, beloved, is what motivates us to love other people enough to impart a saving message that gives them hope. Because then that love overflows onto other people, right? That's why love is at the top of the list of, of what, is, what is to characterize the believer. Love for God first, and then as, a, as an overflow of that love, love for other people. And that manifests itself in the way that we carry out our mission, that we share the message of Christ. Romans 5, uh, verse 5 says this, the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Oh, the Holy Spirit has come into our lives, beloved, and empowers us to be able to love Christ and love others. This is God, God's love for Paul, what fuels his passion to plead with people that they would come to know Jesus Christ. This is why in 2 Corinthians 5.20, Love for people is why he says that as though God were making an appeal through us, he says, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Listen, you cannot just, just put on a facade in doing that, right? 
That kind of pleading with sinners, with tears and prayers, and an active pursuit of people and relationships for the purpose of sharing the gospel is driven and motivated by our understanding of the fact that Jesus gave his life for us, beloved. His love for us. And so hear me. It's lovelessness that ultimately keeps us from sharing and proclaiming the gospel to other people. Did you hear that? Ultimately, it's lovelessness, a lack of love that keeps us from sharing and proclaiming the gospel to people. Furthermore, you know what the problem is with us? Is that we love ourselves too much. The issue is not love yourself more. The issue is love God more and love yourself less, right? Why do we allow our fears and our sense of inadequacy to keep us from sharing Christ? Because we're more focused on how we feel and what other, thing, other people th- think of us than focusing on how we can love God and love people enough to share Christ. The problem is our love, beloved, our love. Sometimes this lovelessness shows itself in not wanting to sacrifice our time. Not wanting to be inconvenienced. We're too focused on our comforts. You know, I got humbled in this area last Sunday. Last Sunday was Father's Day. And my precious little family, uh, my wife tells me, honey, we want to go get a special lunch for you. So just go home, um, get refreshed, change and all of that. And we'll join you at some point at the house with a, with a good meal. And I said, thank you, honey. So I went to the house and I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be great. Refreshing afternoon. Who knows what they're going to be bringing. Woo! I'm so excited. All of a sudden, what do I hear? And I'm thinking, oh, no. My family wouldn't knock. Okay, they just come in, okay? (laughs) You know, Chloe just (laughs) storms in with everybody else, right? I hear this knock, and I go over to the window, and I peek, and it's two young ladies with with, with handbags and Bibles in their hands. And I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no, I want to relax. I want to be able to just enjoy a meal with my family. What in the world? So I decided to open the door. And right as I opened the door, before I could even say anything, one of the girls says, thank you, sir, for, for your time. We're here to tell you the good news of the prophecy of our Heavenly Father and our Mother God. Like, oh, man. And then my dukes went up. And I started to listen, and I listened for a while. Eventually, my family got there, and for about an hour, I stood there. It was a gracious conversation that we had, at least on this side. But it was an ongoing debate, calling them to the one true God in Scripture, calling them to repent of the fact that they are preaching heresy and deceiving people on on that street and that block. And on and on the conversation went. Listen, beloved, it was a divine appointment, wasn't it? It was a divine. There's no coincidences. And at that moment, I was humbled because my comfort and my relaxation was more important than reaching these ladies for Jesus Christ. And the more that the conversation went on, the more I was grieved in my heart as I looked at their eyes and how deceived they were and how twisted they were and deluded they were as they were taking scriptures out of context and going all over the place. It was so discombobulated and so confusing. Listen, the Lord brings Um, opportunities like that to our attention all the time, doesn't he? Let me ask you, are you living aware, anticipating God's divine appointments? Opportunities that God brings to us every single day? Just Friday night, we have a men's softball team. And I had an opportunity randomly, the the captain of our team asked me, Kempis, can you share the gospel? I'm like, got to be ready to go. Share the gospel. And then afterward, he had me share, talk to another guy, counsel him on issues regarding the gospel. And it was a wonderful time. That is our life, isn't it? Listen, if you do not know the gospel well enough, even just basic, uh, the basic components of the gospel, beloved, then you need to go and get some training, right? At the very least, share your testimony and talk to them about what Jesus did for you. And you know what? Naturally, you will be led to share some of those components of, what, of the person and the work of Christ, right? Your testimony is not the gospel, but your testimony can be a springboard to talking about the good news of the person and the work of Christ, right? How he's changed you. He says, Kempis, how do I know? How do I recognize those opportunities? 
Well, look in your home. Think about your extended family, those physical connections that God has already given you on, in this life. It could have been anyone else that you could have been related to, biologically speaking or physically speaking. Who is that extended family that doesn't know the Lord? Have you ever witnessed to them about Jesus Christ? Are you building strategic relationships so that you have an opportunity or a platform to share Christ with them? The other day I heard the testimony of a sister here who was talking to me about a trip that she took and she said how one of the things that she did was take two of her, of her photo albums of mission trips that she's taken and she took those and began showing her non-believing family about the trip and through that I'm sure she had an opportunity to talk to them about why she does those things, why she travels to a foreign country where she gets tired and has to uh, spend all kinds of resources, physical and monetary resources. She's going to have to explain to them things about the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? See, we can use so many different things to, to reach out to our loved ones. Where do you live? Let me ask you, do you know your neighbors? Seriously, beloved, do you know your neighbors? Do you know who lives to your right and to your left? Do you know who lives across the street from you? Do you know them? Are you cultivating a relationship with them? Do you show kindness to your neighbor? How is your relationship with those that are geographically close to you where you live? How about where do you work? Do your coworkers even know that you're a Christian? Do people even know that you're a Christian where you work? Do they see the way that you speak? Do they see your work ethic that you are at the top of, the, of your game as far as hard workers who are trying to make a profit for the company so that they have an opportunity to see you display Christ even in your conduct, and then that becomes a springboard for you to share about Jesus Christ with them. But do they even know that you're a Christian? I met Christians who, their coworkers don't even know that they're believers. They don't even know. What about here at the church? Do you take opportunities to evangelize people? Even as a collective body, do you go to, with the evangelism team? Friday or Saturday nights, do you take opportunity with Dale Van Trees and the deacon team to go visit people at hospitals, some of whom are not believers? Maybe you take opportunities to do that through the local church. What about um, Burbank Healthcare and the ministry that we have into that particular location right across the, the, our parking lot? How oftentimes do you go with people and you inquire about, can I go there and minister to people and maybe counsel some of these elderly folks who are in their last days and they are prime beloved to share the gospel with, Right? They are ready to hear the gospel. What about our geographical location here in Burbank in L.A.? When you hear about the human trafficking going on, one of the epicenters here in Los Angeles of human trafficking, you, you, you should know, do you, does, your heart, does your heart ache for that? Do you long to go share the gospel with people who are involved or engaged in having delivered others from that particular thing or those who are, who are um, uh, victims of human sex trafficking? Do you have a heart for that ministry? What about the jail ministries around our, our LA area? We have brethren here in this church who you can ask about going and ministering to inmates getting a permit to go in and sharing your faith with individuals, obviously taking certain parameters and precautions. But do you have a heart for all of the people in jail in our Los Angeles area? How eager, passionate are you for the lost? Because all of these people, beloved, are lost. They're lost. You recognize that all of these sins that I've described, transsexual, homosexual lifestyles, all of these sins that we constantly see around us are symptoms of a greater, deeper problem. You know what the problem is? People need Jesus. People need Jesus. All of those other things are symptomatic. They're serious sins, but they're symptomatic of a deep problem that people have, that they need to be rescued from their sins. They need salvation from their sins. Do we love the Lord and love people enough to want to see them come to know Christ? The gospel must be our purpose. The gospel must be our passion. Third, I want you to notice that the gospel must be our power. The gospel must be our power. We must have confidence. As my brother Tim said earlier, confidence in the power of the gospel. 
Listen, Paul was eager to preach the gospel in Rome, the epicenter of paganism and idolatry, because he believed in the power of God. He knew he had nothing in and of himself to be able to save anyone. He couldn't change or transform anyone, but he knew the message that could, right? He knew who could. Look at verse 16. For, why is Paul eager to share the gospel? For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul says, whether it's my countrymen or the so-called sophisticated intellectuals, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And the reason, it is God's power at work to deliver people. The gospel is the power of God for salvation, he says. God's energy is, is behind this message that we proclaim, this good news of the person and the work of Christ. And you ask, salvation from what? Right? Salvation from what? Salvation from sin. Sin. Listen, you can reform people on the outside. You can help people get better jobs. You can help people take social action. You can do all of those things, but only God can change the root problem of all those things. It is sin in the human heart, beloved. The gospel alone has the power to, to, to extinguish the volcano from its very core, if you will. Sin's punishment. It's God's power for salvation from sin's power and sin's punishment. Sin is the great problem of the gospel, beloved. Sin. Sin is what separates us from God. It is our sin that is the reason why we will experience the consequences of God upon us, the just punishment of God. And so that is the, the problem, the core problem that the gospel answers and gives a solution to. Now listen, Paul was human just like you and I. He said, you know, Kempis, I hear what you're saying, but oftentimes there are things that, you know, it's hard, isn't it? And it is hard. And that's why Paul says here, he is not ashamed of the gospel. The reason, beloved, why Paul can speak about not being ashamed of the gospel is because he was human just like us, and he struggled himself, I'm sure, at different times as a human being with being ashamed of the gospel. I mean, he was con there's constant opposition against Paul. Read about his the constant opposition in 2 Corinthians. Constant opposition, constant persecution, there were times when Paul, being a human, struggled with being ashamed of the gospel because the best of men are men at best, right? Everybody struggles. And so he encouraged Timothy also, knowing this weakness. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. He says, Timothy... Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Paul in 2 Timothy was, was in jail. He was suffering in jail. He says, listen, I am not ashamed. 2 Timothy 1.12, for this reason I also suffer these things, he says, but I am not ashamed for I know whom I believed and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. That's beautiful, isn't it? 2 Timothy, there's a man who is in jail, who is suffering who doesn't have the same freedom to go proclaim the gospel. Those were the latter days, stages of Paul's life. And Paul says, I've entrusted myself to God. I am in his hand. Therefore, Timothy, suffer with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Suffer with me. It's part of being a follower of Christ. So Paul struggled with this. Timothy, his young child in the faith, struggled with being ashamed of the gospel. Beloved, what are some ways that we can be ashamed of the gospel? What are some ways that we show that we are ashamed of the gospel, whether knowingly or maybe unknowingly for most of us? We can be ashamed of the gospel, as I just mentioned, by fearing opposition or suffering, right? Fearing opposition or suffering from family members, people that we love, coworkers, neighbors, so forth and so forth. You know, if I say something, they won't like me. I'm going to get treated with indifference. I'm going to be treated like a weirdo. I'm going to be ostracized by these people. We tend to think like that, right? We can be ashamed of the gospel by fearing such opposition and pushback and suffering. But listen to me. I would rather not please men, but please Christ. Amen? 
Listen to what Jesus says in Mark 8, 38. For whoever is ashamed of me in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man, speaking of himself, will also be ashamed of him or her when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Listen, which do you prefer? Do you prefer to fear men or to disappoint Christ? I'd rather not shame Christ. We can be ashamed of the gospel by relegating it to a secondary place in our lives. Other things become more important. Other things become our mission fields. The American dream becomes our mission field. Accumulating wealth, success, education, and the gospel of Jesus Christ takes the backseat to all of our pursuits of our American dream, right? We can be ashamed of the gospel by relegating it to a secondary place in our lives. We can be ashamed of the gospel by not proclaiming it, simply not speaking the truth. You know what? I'll just let my life speak for itself. Listen, your life is not the gospel message. Your life, live for the glory of God in obedience to God's commands, displays the transforming power of the gospel, but it is now a springboard to you sharing the actual message of Jesus, right? You need to share the gospel. I'm too busy. I don't have time. Listen, some of us are so distracted, as I mentioned, so consumed with so many other things, so many misplaced priorities, that we simply do not proclaim the gospel. We say we don't have time, but we don't make time. And worse than that, we are not spiritually sensitive to the divine appointments, to the people that God has put before us to share the message of Christ. And in so doing, we show that we're ashamed of the gospel by not proclaiming it. We show that we're ashamed of the gospel, listen to me, by denying it by how we live. Did you hear that? By denying it in how we live. Our conduct oftentimes is a contradiction to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, people don't want to hear what we have to say as believers. It's not that we're called to be perfect, but that even when we blow it, we should be broken and show people the gospel by showing humility and brokenness and seeking forgiveness from people, right? Titus 2, 11 through 14 is your classic text on not only the fact that the gospel saves, but that the gospel sanctifies. Sanctification is that lifelong process of God changing us so that we become more and more like Jesus Christ. Beloved, listen to me. If people are not seeing you be sanctified, you live out in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, his commands in your life, how do you expect anybody to want to listen to you? Why would they want to glorify God with their lives if Jesus is not number one in yours? Right? Why should I want Jesus? You look so miserable all the time. You have no joy. You don't seem like you have a sense of purpose. Are you kidding me? I'd rather just continue to pursue the other things that at least even if temporarily they give me pleasure, I will pursue them instead of this Jesus that you proclaim. We can be ashamed of the gospel by lacking confidence in its power. Lacking confidence in its power. Listen to me. For some of us, if we dig deep enough, you simply don't believe that the gospel can make a difference to you. You simply don't believe that the gospel can change and transform a human heart. Oh, you're getting, that's hardcore. Yeah, unbelief is at the heart of our lack of action, right? We don't believe in the power of the gospel, and that's why Paul says, listen, I am eager, passionate, zealous to proclaim the gospel in the epicenter of paganism, the capital city of Rome, because the gospel is the power of God for salvation, to deliver people from the power and the penalty of sin. I want to preach the gospel to you and be fruitful among you. Power. Not from us, beloved. Not from us. From God himself, right? Right? This is the means that he has designed, the proclamation, the sharing of Jesus with other people to save people and give them hope and forgiveness and reconcile sinners to himself. Why are we we withholding the gospel from people and ashamed of the gospel? Haven't we seen our own lives? I mean, look around this sanctuary right now. Do you know some of the brethren that are here? You know some of their backgrounds. I've told you publicly some of my background, haven't I? 
We rehearse those things to be reminded of how much we were haters of God, cursers of God. Others of us were slanderers, violent, angry people, fornicators, having sex outside of marriage, immoral, adulterers. We were those who were thieves and liars and deceivers. What happened? Somebody preached the gospel to us and God raised us from spiritual death. Right, beloved? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Therefore, do not be ashamed of it. Do not, excuse me, be ashamed of it. Paul speaks of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse 9. And he says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, if you practice those things then you are not a Christian. If you're living in a settled way in those sins, and he's giving just categories, a short, a sampling of some sins, right? All sin ultimately leads to death and eternal separation from God. He says, you're not, you don't belong to the kingdom of God if you practice these things. But then lest we get self-righteous and forget about ourselves, look at verse 11. Such were some of you. Such were some of us, whether these categories or whatever other category that you know of concerning yourself. Such were some of you, but what happened? But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Glory to God that the power of the gospel visited our human hearts and transformed us, beloved. Otherwise, there would be no hope for sinners such as you and, you and I. The gospel is the power of God. Let us not be ashamed of this, of, of this power. Now listen, with all this talk about the gospel, a reasonable question to ask is, what is it? What is the gospel, right? I mean, Paul is going to spend the rest of Romans articulating the gospel and the glories of the gospel to these Roman Christians in a beautiful, profound way. But here, in verse 17, if you notice, he gives a very general synopsis of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 17. For in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It's better translated the righteousness from God. The righteousness which comes to us from God. You know what this refers to here? To the righteous status given to us by God when we trust Jesus Christ. It's law courtroom seen kind of language, beloved. Suppose that you are the person on trial at this great trial. And after all the facts have been gathered, the judge calls you forward and the judge says, sir, after all of the facts have now been gathered, the jury finds you guilty. You are condemned and contrary to the typical scenes that we watch, in this particular situation, what is worse is that you know that the evidence is true. You're convinced of it. You know it's true. You're guilty as charged. The verdict is just and righteous. You are convinced that you should not argue. You are receiving the condemnation that you deserve. Picture it. No hope at all. And you know it. But an amazing thing happens. A person comes forward, one who is completely innocent, and he says, Judge, I want and will take the punishment that this person deserves. I want to take their place. And listen to this. It's my joy to do so. It's my joy to do so. See, the judge can't just let you go. He can't just let you go. Someone must pay the price of your wrongdoing. Otherwise, what kind of stinking court system is this, right? What kind of judge doesn't uphold the law and just simply lets you go just to be nice to you, just to be gracious to you? He you know, you can't sweep your, your wrongdoing under the rug. He can't. Otherwise, he is not a just judge. Who wants to stand before a judge who is not just? None of us do on the human level, right? 
The judge then proceeds, once this person has come forward to handcuff that person, and not only does he declare you not guilty, but he pronounces upon you a standing and a status of not, of, of innocent. Innocent. This is what Paul means, beloved, by the righteousness which comes from God. That righteousness is revealed in the inner workings of the gospel, if you will. That is the great doctrine of justification by faith. God could not sweep our sin under the rug, otherwise he is not holy, not just. So what happened? Christ absorbed our sin and our punishment for our sins upon himself, making it gloriously possible that God would be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ, right? Romans chapter 3, verse 26, that's what Paul means when he says that God would be both just and the justifier of the one who believes in Christ. How is that possible? Jesus took upon himself the fullness of the Father's wrath for your sins and for my sins. The gospel is glorious, isn't it? It's glorious. As Paul is expanding upon the power of the gospel, beloved, he's saying that the gospel reveals the righteousness which comes from God. That is the righteous status given to us by God by virtue of Christ's person and his work on the cross. Glorious, glorious truth. That's why he's so eager to preach this gospel and what activates this This salvation, notice verse 17 again. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. He's saying in essence from person to person. It's parallel with what Paul says in the previous verse. That the the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Faith, trust, activates the righteousness of God from a human perspective. Salvation comes by faith. It has nothing to do with human works. It has nothing to do with your attendance. It has nothing to do with where you grew up. It's got nothing to do with human merit, human achievements. It has everything to do with what Jesus did. Justification is God's free act solely based upon the perfect life and the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross. And the vindication of all of it was Jesus' glorious resurrection and ascension, right? God approved of what Christ did. Perfect 10, on your behalf, if you trust in Jesus Christ, beloved. Salvation comes by faith alone. And Paul reminds us that it's always been by faith alone. Verse 17, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Quotation from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, where Habakkuk the prophet is is perplexed in Habakkuk about, Lord, why is it that you are going to use the Babylonians, a people more wicked than your own people, Israel, to punish them? And Habakkuk is perplexed. He can't believe it. And then God reminds him, oh, no, 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 Habakkuk. Just as I punish my people, I'm going to punish the Babylonians as well. They're not going to get away with it either. No. And then the lesson to Habakkuk in the midst of his perplexity is this. He wanted Habakkuk to trust God, to live by faith. The righteous man shall live by faith, right? Salvation is by faith. What a beautiful, general synopsis of the gospel. And he explodes it up in the rest of the book, of the book of Romans, the glories of of the gospel. This is, beloved, what theologians refer to as the great exchange. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. The great exchange. Our sin placed upon Christ at the cross who bore our sins, absorbed God's wrath for our sins, and Christ's righteousness placed upon us so that God sees us righteous as Christ is righteous. Luther called this an alien righteousness. An alien, a righteousness outside of ourselves because we have no righteousness in ourselves. None of us can measure up to God's holy and perfect standard. There's nothing we can do to earn or merit God's favor. It is all when we are clothed in Christ's righteousness. That's how we receive salvation. And Christ's righteousness is wrecking to our account. Listen, if you don't know Christ this morning, listen to me. One day you will stand before God and I will stand before God and none of us will be able to find favor in his eyes based upon our own righteousness. Picture it being dressed in your own clothing. 
you will not stand. You will be eternally separated from God in a place called hell. Eternally separated from him. But if you are clothed in Christ's spotless, shiny, blazing righteousness, his perfect life, and his atoning death has been applied to your account, you will be with God forever and ever and ever, eternal life. How glorious that is. So put your trust in Christ today. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Listen, beloved, for us who are believers, is this the gospel that you are living for? Is this the gospel that you are living for? Is it your purpose in this life to share the gospel in whatever context God has you? Are you fulfilling your mission as a Christian to make Jesus known? If you love him, then you will keep his commandments, right? And part of those commandments is making him known to other people who need to hear about him, who need hope. Do you believe the gospel is powerful to save? Just look at your life and look at the lives of other believers around you. Do you believe that God is able to do that for others? Nobody is unreachable, beloved. Nobody is beyond the, the reach of God's grace. And so let us focus on our, on our mission as Christians. Amen? Let us focus on our mission. In the early morning of April 15th, 1912, the so-called unsinkable ship. What, what ship was that? The Titanic. You know the story. The so-called unsinkable ship, the Titanic, struck an iceberg And then two hours and 40 or 45 minutes later, the so-called unsinkable ship sunk. Sunk. About 2,224 people were on that Titanic. And it says that, history tells us that about 1,500 people or so died when that ship sunk. One of those who died of hypothermia was a Scottish preacher by the name of John Harper. John Harper, maybe you've heard of him. He was on his way to Chicago to preach, and some say that he was on his way also to take over the famous church in Chicago that had been pastored by D.L. Moody. That's how gifted this man was, John Harper, and he was on that ship. But it was not to be, of course, that he would take over that church. Harper died during that great um, tragedy. But Harper was a man who was a focused Christian living for mission. As the water was submerging the Titanic, there are accounts that tell us that Harper swam around helping people, listen to this, providing pieces of wood, whatever he could find in order to prolong the life of people so that he could tell them about Christ. Because from his perspective, there was probably no hope for anybody. He's running around trying to save people from, from obviously passing away so that he could share Christ with them. He did this until he himself died and was submerged under water. And four years later, at a survivor's gathering, a Christian man shared about Harper's final moments. This is what we, how we know about Harper and what he was doing. And how Harper had repeatedly asked this man, this Christian man now, if he was saved, but at the time he wasn't saved. And the man shares this. Harper kept calling out, man, are you saved to this man? No, I am not, I replied. He shouted back, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. The waves bore Harper away, he says, but a little later he was washed back beside me. Again, are you saved now, Harper asked him. (laughs) Man, relentlessness. No, I answered. Harper said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Then the man writes this, then losing his hold on the wood, Harper sank underwater. And then, alone in the night with two miles of water under me, I trusted Christ as my Savior. I am John Harper's last convert. Wow. Amazing, huh? He was a mission-focused man, wasn't he? All the way to the end, irrespective of his own safety, beloved. Preaching the gospel so that people's, because of people's eternal well-being. I pray that we would be mission-focused Christians in a mission-focused church. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the reminder of the precious gospel that we proclaim. Thank you for the fact that we have been given a stewardship. Help us to be faithful, Lord. Help us to have a heart for Burbank, a heart for Los Angeles, a heart for the nations, a heart for our country. 
Father, help us to be people who are walking in loving obedience to the Great Commission to make disciples, beginning with the proclamation of the person and the work of Christ so that people would be saved from their sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Scripture quotations taken from the New American Standard Bible. Copyright by the Lachman Foundation.